But with no further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start our program tonight. And Robert, go ahead and start sharing your screen because um, uh, you're going to go first. We're going to go in alphabetical order. And this is a this is a talk that we've been talking about doing, and uh, we've got four great arborists. These guys are at the front line of their of of what happens at the cities. And it's one of the hardest jobs out there. And I just have such respect for what they do because they've got to deal with all levels. They've got to deal with the engineers. They've got to deal with other arborists. They've got to deal with the residents and they've got to deal with their own city. So they have to wear many hats. And tonight uh, we've asked them to speak about uh, their requirements for writing a tree prescription because as arborists, Many of us are out there now writing prescriptions for trees and it's often different for each city. So we thought it would be helpful for four of the cities. Um, and we have Robert Bretscheiner from Smyrna. Did I say it right? I say Smyrna, is it Smyrna? That's Smyrna. Smyrna. And um, he also works with Boutte Tree and is an avid skier and is always getting some part replaced on his body. <laughs> <laughs> and we have David Shostak up the city of Alpharetta, who's been such a supporter of the GAA, has helped us host meetings and uh, is really has a great program up in Alpharetta. So we, we definitely, and of course, we could include everybody, but, um, you know, I think this is a good cross section. And maybe we'll do this again next year with some different arbor, city arborists. And David Zaparanik. Uh, from the city of Atlanta. I believe he oversees like 12, is it 12 arborists, David? Yeah, uh, so, and they do a fantastic job and they're just getting better and better at it at, uh, and, and the prescriptions and the review. And they have some new systems in place. So we're gonna hear a little bit about that from him tonight. And uh, Kay Ivanovich who has been a municipal arbor. I actually got certified with her like 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, when she was with DeKalb County and um, she's, she's since been at Brookhaven and now the city of Decatur. We're very, I actually am a resident of city of Decatur, very lucky to have her. And she'll be representing the city of Decatur who does things similar, but different. And as you guys listen to each other's presentations, kind of pick up what the other's saying and maybe how you do it a little bit differently. So us who are writing the prescriptions can kind of understand where we need to fit in with that. And, and particularly um, how we're to follow up. And the format for tonight is I'm gonna have each of them speak. If you wanna put a question in, I will, I will be looking at the Q and A and you can write your question in there and I will see it and I will ask the appropriate arbor arborist, you might say who you want to ask the question to. Um, depending on how time is rolling, we will, um, we will, uh, I, I will either, I, I'm thinking of asking the questions at the end, unless it just seems something that's going to really fit in while we're, while they're talking. So with no further ado, um, we're going to start with Robert. Uh, Robert, it's all yours. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Neil. I'm uh, Robert Brechneider. I am, as Neil said, the city arborist in Smyrna. I'm also the plant health care director at Boutte Tree. So it's at how Smyrna is growing, especially this year, it's like having two jobs with all the plan reviews and all the building that's going on in Smyrna. Um, and I get right into it. Um, when our tree prescriptions required in Smyrna on sites. Um, it's all properties that have a development permit that have development activity going on. Um, the only exemptions of that would be uh, building on a deck to a house um, and um, possibly sheds and stuff like that. Some renovations they'll uh, community development won't um, need a permit for that, which would kind of keep the tree prescription out. Um, and these are just definitions of what a development activity is in the city of Smyrna. Uh,
And when there is development activity is that's when you need a tree care prescription. And in our uh, Smyrna tree ordinance, which was just changed this year um, in January, 2020 was passed by uh, Max Bacon, the mayor that was leaving and city council passed the new tree protection ordinance um, that also covered the technical standards, which I'll have links at the end of the slide show that uh, I will share. Um, so the tree care prescription, the definition is a plan developed by a qualified professional, which is um, a consulting arborist, the board certified arborist or certified arborist or um, a registered forester. And there's to provide a prescription for impacted trees during the entire development process. Um, and kind of going through the best chances of survival for the trees that are being impacted. Um, Okay, so impacted trees, uh, that kind of is defined as trees in protected areas or what I call the tree protection zone. And there may be specimen trees in that mix, boundary trees and other areas. So replacement trees or new landscape trees also need to be put in that prescription or public trees that could be impacted. Um, the development process is that time frame that your prescription needs to be written to, and that is from demo, the issuing of the demo permit or the LDP permit up to when that last unit is CO'd or the house is CO'd. And it also includes the tree maintenance bond period. And that really depends on if there's irrigation to the trees or not. So our maintenance bond runs one year if the trees are being irrigated and then two years if they're not being irrigated. So the qualified professional writing the prescription would need to know that to write that prescription for a little bit longer. And these are just our specimen trees just a list which is in our technical standards and in our ordinance. Um, so we took out the health criteria conditions and it's just basically now dead, dying or hazardous trees wouldn't be considered a specimen tree. Uh, who is el eligible to write these prescriptions? So writing a prescription and executing a prescription can be done um, by uh, multiple people. Um, when I'm writing a prescription, it's usually I'm writing it and I'm the one out there doing it. But it can run through the surveyor who's doing the trees on site to the engineer who gets that plan to the landscape architect who reviews that also, that hires a, um, an arborist to do the tree inventory who may not do prescriptions and then they'll write the prescription. And so you have multiple arborists sometimes involved. So it's just a qualified professional that can write these prescriptions and what I call the project arborist would be the one that's on the site actually doing the bore sprays or monitoring of the trees, um, chemical treatments. And that could be two different people also. So you may have somebody who is, um, has his chemical license, him or her has, has his chemical license that can spray trees, but doesn't do any tree removal. So there may be multiple arborists, um, but I try to stick to one who wrote the prescription that is in charge of 
who they hired to do the the prescription. Um, prescriptions are typically submitted. Um, I would like to get them prior to the first submittal. <laughs> that typically doesn't happen. Um, at, at least have somebody involved in writing it as they submit the first time and then I'll send back my comments. So a qualified professional should go out on the site, um, do a tree inventory or at least um, inspect the tree inventory if it was done by a different arborist and that document should be on the plan. It should cover your, your basic inventory with health and structure, tree number, all specimen trees should be tagged. Um, and if the tree is not a specimen or in that DDH um, criteria, supply that report, either pictures or tree risk assessment form, drillings, tomograph readings, whatever you have in that report and in that plan that is submitted. Uh, boundary trees would be included. And that is basically a tree health assessment. Unless you get permission from the owner of that tree to go on their property, you can gather more data. Um, boundary trees would require a tree maintenance bond document, which is on the city website all these documents for me. Um, that is basically you're doing the, the report, getting the, the maintenance bond and that bond for a boundary tree is $140 an inch in diameter, plus the removal cost of the tree. And that's a five year bond. And um, that gets submitted and should be on the plan and at some point by the final, um, by the final submittal, that definitely should be on the plan. And then any signed documents from the tree owner. Um, tree prescriptions should follow the format that um, we drew up when writing, rewriting the technical standards. And I kind of based it off of the ISA's best management practices for construction, which kind of goes over um, four, you know, phases of a, a construction site. The, if there's demo being done at the demo stage, what's, what's happening pre-construction, which is typically pretty short. And then throughout the whole construction period, to when that CO is issued and then post-construction, which is either that one or two years for the new, new landscape, any additional um, monitoring and pruning for those new trees, just so they survive. Um, when you're writing that prescription, and I'll have some um, examples further on, but definitely put specific time frames, or if it's unknown, just, but it really is to be determined depending on the construction phase. So when I'm, when that's submitted, I'm reading through that and I kind of rely on the arborists that are out on site and what kind of impacts are being done to the tree that, you know, you're all certified and you've been in the industry a lot and you should know how to write the prescription. If there's anything lacking or missing, I'll definitely let you know. Um, and then talking to your client or the engineering firm talking to the owners about the plan needs to be prepaid and that paid receipt needs to be sent to community development before we issue an LDP for that site or a demo permit. Um, Robert? I, Robert? Yes. 
Um, just so you know, I know you're going first, and I didn't, I forgot, you have about five more minutes, just FYI. Okay. Yeah. And I'm I, have, done. I have a question for you from Jesse Milton about the technical standards. Can you give an example of one and then where they can be found? Let me uh, continue on with my show and I'll show you. Um, this, so my city comments, I'll usually get them, get them, review them within a couple days. And then I'll email that out to the um, landscape architect, the, the arborist who's doing the prescription. And if the owner is in that email, I'll comment to them also. So these, this is the example treat care prescription that's in our technical standards. So it's kind of broken down. Well, this has five um, stages. So planning, design, pre-construction, construction and post-construction kind of goes through um, during this first paragraph, it's kind of letting me know how long this project's going on for. And then you're just plugging in all these numbers of when it's starting and what's stopping. And then it just kind of goes from here is, okay, the first thing we're gonna do is um, in the tree protection zone during pre-construction, you're gonna walk the site um, if, you, if it's a large site, I'm going to inspect the tree protection fence and make sure it's all in the right area. And usually on smaller sites, the project arborist doesn't need to be there. And then if there's demo going on, if the, the project arborist is going to be on site, if they're demoing a building or if they're getting near any trees, if um, pruning needs to be done for large equipment and just goes on to canopy pruning, it could be some weed control, root pruning, mulching, root pruning one. Is there more canopy pruning to do? Do the trees need lightning protection? And these, this is all done either during construction or some of these are pre-construction. So just listing that out. Um, this is a prescription that was submitted to the city for an example. Um, and this arborist, you know, listed which trees need to be done, the boundary trees that were being impacted, what they were gonna do. So the, they're gonna be out there during the tree protection, during root pruning, um, at the installation of the erosion control. And then they were gonna be back out to do root pruning after the grading's been done because you can root prune during the erosion control, but sometimes they're doing large cuts or clearing areas. There's a the lots of impacts to the soil. So they were gonna go back out there and catch any roots um, canopy pruning, just of course for deadwood over the site and uh, kind of lists out everything. And then they have for the trees that are being planted on the site, so that's post-construction where they're coming out and they're going to be involved with the pre-planting meeting. So at before CO, I'm usually, we have a pre-planting um, meeting that I meet with either the owner or the landscape company to discuss the, um, how the city of Smyrna wants to plant the tree, even though the detail is on the plan of how we want to do it. It's always best to kind of go over those with the landscaper. Um, I'll go through this pretty quick the optimal tree care prescription. Uh, make sure you read the technical standards and going through my arborist 
plan review checklist, um, obtain that full set of plans from the engineering firm or the landscape architect. So you're, you have all the pages and just not the tree protection plan that you can see where grading's going on and cuts and fills. Um, review any of the tree inventory reports to make sure that they're up to date. I've been on some sites that the inventory, the survey was done three, four years ago and things have changed. Trees have died, trees have been removed, some are hazardous. Um, and then actually going to visit the site, even though I am guilty of not going on sites and writing tree prescriptions, that's bad. Um, working with the engineering firm on any tree impacts. So the city of Smyrna, you can impact up to the structural root plate. That is one change, which is if that, so that's where I kind of look at the site and if, and they, so we remove the tree bond for specimen trees, but we've laid a heavy burden on the technical standards and this prescription if builders really want to push that limit and impact up to the critical uh, up to the structural root plate of trees, that's where I'm going to be asking for a lot to protect that tree. Um, and just talking to client about prepaid prescription, and then after each site visit that the um, project arborist has made, is definitely taking photographic documentation of all your site visits and emailing that report to me and I'll forward it off to community development. So that qualified professionals, you know, emailing his client that he was out there doing the work and telling me that this was done, if there was any changes. And that is, that's it, that's my information. Um, I don't know if these are clickable links, but um, any plan reviews or comments, you should always copy Caitlin Crow at Community Development because um, she keeps track of all the prepaid prescriptions and the plans that are coming in. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Robert. And uh, next up is Kay. Uh, from the city of Decatur. Let me get that sharing up. All right, Kay, you're up. Okay, great. So Neil is driving my show, so I'm just going to tell him to switch screens when we're ready. I'm Kay Ivanovich, the arborist for the city of Decatur, and uh, we have a big whopping four square miles that we have to deal with, but there's a lot going on in this city all the time. So Neil, go ahead and switch that slide. Okay, so what's needed when? Well, you've got two stages. One is pre-construction. So you're doing a written protective prescription plan of how they're going to protect the trees. And then if there are mistakes, then you have the after or during construction written treatment and recovery plan. Um, we know that they try to do things exactly by the plans, but it doesn't always go as planned and sometimes things get messy. So that's what we're looking for. What's needed when? Neil, go ahead. Okay, so first off, when you're doing your, um, your prescriptions and your tree plans for City Decatur, make sure you're using net critical root zones. Um, you know, if the tree doesn't have roots under a, a cement wall, uh, retaining wall, then I don't expect to see that giant circle going out into nowhere. Um, so you're, you're looking at the net critical root zone. Um, so that is going to be a big indicator as to how much they can do um, without really impacting that tree. And Decatur sets a limit basically that you're not supposed to go over 20% of the critical root zone um, without a prescription. It ties all back to industry standards. So it depends. Trees are all individuals, different species adapt to different things. We all know certain trees handle impaction better than other trees. So there may be a tree with, with a little bit different situation that could actually go a little bit more than 20%. Uh, 
um, say uh, industry standard can say up to 33% in certain species in certain situations. So I try and keep that in mind, but your, your prescriptions should reflect that, what that tree actually has in its net critical root zone, how much is actually being affected and how is it being affected. Go ahead and switch, Neil. So pre-construction protective measures, you're looking at doing hand machine clearing of the um, hand machine, like you know, a walk behind weed eater, things like that. Um, clearing of weeds and brush, um, ivy, getting the ivy cut if there's you know trees that have been neglected on a lot. Um, mulching two to four inches of depth um, to the tree fence that you're gonna be setting um, to keep the tree protected. If there's gonna be an area where they're going to go over with equipment, obviously we wanna limit that compaction happening to the soil. So in that instance, you may be specking out four inches depth um, of mulch to try and protect that tree. Um, but that all needs to be shown. Um, limb pruning, growth regulators, uh, pesticide bark spray, root dredges, you know, root bridge. If you're gonna, you know, if you've got a tree that your client really wants to save um, and you can build a temporary root bridge to get the equipment and stuff, you know, over that tree, um, show me a detail. How are we gonna do that? So that's the kind of thing I'm looking for in a pre-constructive um, pre-construction, sorry, protective measure. And then of course, you know, your, your tree protection fence, hay bales, chain link, whatever it is you think is gonna be best. Um, and minimum is gonna be the orange fence um, with hay bales. Um, and then a watering schedule, especially if we're going through the summer months um, and we're hitting that drought area. If we can treat, keep the trees wet, they can keep protecting themselves a lot of times, you know, without enough water, they have trouble and they start succumbing. So go ahead, Neil, and switch. So just to reiterate, weed eat, mow, hand pull, mulch, prune before construction. And man, I wish I'd had a bike like that when I was a kid, or maybe I should get one for my daughter. Anyway, uh, sorry, I digress. Neil, go ahead and switch. Okay, so tree protection, that's, that's a big one. All the way through the project, you all know we want the cannons in front of the tree to keep them out of there because inevitably that's the great place to store equipment. That's the place we want to drop our build lumber package. That's the place we want to wash out our paint and chemicals. You know, if we have the signs up both in English and in Spanish that say tree protection area, keep out posted along that orange fence with either hay bales as a dissuader or, and if they can use as, you know, get that for erosion controls as well. Um, you know, stuff to keep them out of that root zone that we are trying to protect. So we settle for the orange and signs. Okay, any chemical controls that you think that tree will need to survive the project? Fungicides, pesticides, insecticidal soaps, growth regulators, we all know them. Um, whatever you think is gonna help that tree survive what they're proposing. Go ahead, Neil. Okay, so indicator, like a lot of places, we have boundary tree agreements. Well, those boundary tree agreements are going to require one of two things. Either they're going to agree, both of them, that the tree should come down. And that's between the builder applicant for a build permit or development permit and the tree owner, property owner. So if they decide to keep the tree and treat it, that's when your arborist is going to be involved. So as an arborist, you're gonna come in, your prescription for that should include tree protection like chain link. <laughs> I would strongly recommend that because you're not talking about damage to somebody's own tree, you're talking about the neighbor's tree. And they're gonna to wanna to make sure that exactly what you spec out is done. So in that instance, you may wanna be looking at chain link, state tape bells and orange fence. Um, at least two years of inspections in spring and fall. Um, two years of pesticide applications, because you know once a tree goes into a little bit of stress, oh, we have all those lovely pests in the area, ambrosia beetle, pine beetles, whatever's out there, they're going to be interested um, when that tree starts putting out that stress chemical. Um, uh, let's see, a watering schedule is really good, like I said, keep them wet, then they can, you know, hopefully fight off a lot of stuff on their own. And you may want to include, if you talk to that neighbor owner, um, an application of a growth regulator mycorrhizal fungi, whatever it's going to take to assist that tree through this process. Go ahead, Neil. So let's talk about the other end of the spectrum. My buddy Donald here, you know, is going out during a construction inspection and oh my gosh, the tree saves down. The tree that was supposed to be there isn't anymore. It's just a stump. Or, you know, they've gotten into the tree save area. We've all seen it. 
that's where you're coming in with the post construction or during construction or after construction prescriptive measures. Go ahead, Neil. So we're doing stuff like, okay, the guy uh, that was dropping off the lumber packet, put it in the wrong place and bashed the tree. All right, so you're looking at bark tracing. Uh, obviously the ones on the left, I don't expect to see a prescription for bark tracing for. That's a little bit extreme. Those trees are gonna be written off as, as you know no good and they're gonna end up paying fines and whatever else and having to replace the canopy. It's the small nicks like you're seeing on the right-hand side of the, of the images. Those can be bark traced. Um, just cleaned up so the tree has the best chance of compartmentalizing around those wounds. Go ahead, Neil. Soil decompaction, whoops. Um, you know, the different types is out there. We have the hydro air tools, we have the compressed air tool. You know, getting that soil decompacted is probably the best thing you can do for a tree that's had compaction happen. It gives it a big leg up in trying to get this process started again within that root zone, especially those fine um, fine roots, feeder roots. Go ahead, Neil. Vertical mulching, just another way to get it accomplished um, if you don't have access to the other tools. Um, and in some cases, it may not be a huge amount of disturbance, or you're not maybe dragging something else, so you might want to utilize this method um, if it's not as, you know, a, a large area of, of compaction that happened. Go ahead, Neil. Radial aeration, just another one. You can utilize it. You see this done a lot with the um, the air, air tools, um, you doing those trenches and then backfilling works really well. Good. Um, in addition to that decompaction, treatments to help the tree recover. So you're looking at doing things again, like three years of inspection, spring and fall to make sure that nothing's going wrong. You know, and, and that way you really can tell if what's occurring is occurring because of the construction impact. Or you, know, you can see the lightning strike pattern and that's why the tree's dying. You know, you want to make sure that, that the impaction you're seeing is actually from the construction that was done. Um, two years of pesticide treatments, again, just to ward off those pests that we have in the area. Um, a watering schedule. We all know how important water is to those trees. Can't stress that out enough. Um, and you also, again, may want to include the growth regulator to make the tree focus on replacing those damaged roots. You know, if it's not growing that top, and pushing out leaves as many as it, it would in a normal year, then it's gotta be focused on putting out roots. And, and as long as we didn't have a huge loss or any loss preferably of, um, of the limbs up top, then you know, that growth regulator might be a good way to help that tree recover. The mycorrhizal fungi, everybody's had arguments about it, but um, I, you know, from my stuff that I've seen on sites over the years, um, and I've been doing this for a while, um, I think it really does help because it's that symbiotic relationship of attaching to that tree root and actually letting it pull up more water and nutrient. So I've seen that work really well if it's done right. Um, so, you know, getting it mixed into the soil is so that it's available to those roots that are trying to recover it is a big thing. Um, and go ahead, Neil. And then, of course, for City of Decatur, proof of payment is required for prescriptions and treatments. Um, had too many instances happen um, in past where, you know, an arborist did a prescription, never got paid. So, you know, we want you to be paid for the work you do. Um, so we want to see that prescription up front. Um, and just to go over a couple of little things, um, I know in Smyrna, um, Robert was talking about, you know, the different trees and what this applies to will indicate everything's protected. So anything over six inches diameter at breast height is considered a protected tree. We don't really have um, specimen protection or anything like that. We do have some championship trees um, listed with Trees Atlanta, but for the city of Decatur, they decided anything over six inches is, is a protected tree. So it also applies to any property under construction, anybody that's having to pull a permit to disturb soils, whether it be a house build, an addition, a pool, um, a, a land development. We don't have a whole lot of that in my little fair, four square miles, but we do get some redevelopment. So you're looking at that too. Um, we're looking for those prescriptions where trees are going to be disturbed more than 20% of their critical root zone. So if it's more than 20% of the critical root zone, I'm gonna to expect to see a, per, a, a prescription. Um, and then uh, there's a interesting rule, which I kind of like indicators code that says that you can't build anything within 10 feet of the trunk of any tree. 
So that's something else to keep in mind. If, if you see your client's design and it's going to be 10 feet to the trunk of the tree and they want to save this tree, well, the code says you can't do it. So keep that in mind. Um, let's see, again, like, uh, like Robert said, if you on your tree plan identify the number of, per, you know, assign a number or a letter to each tree, it makes it a lot easier to know which ones you're talking about. And um, we also need a, a tree planting plan um, as well, especially on the larger sites, you're getting a page of tree planting detail and a page of tree protection detail. So um, we're looking for that too. On the smaller sites, like the smaller home builds and additions, you can usually do it all on the same site plan, but just make sure it's shown, give a symbol for your, where you're planting canopy back, because remember Decatur is a canopy ordinance. We don't do inches per acre. Now, our website, um, if you want to find anything, it's uh, decaturga.com forward slash trees. And Neil, I had that in the, in the uh, presentation I sent you. I think you showed the old one. I actually had a page on the new one that had that in there. But that's where you can reach um, the Decatur tree page is decaturga.com forward slash trees. Um, and it'll take you to all the information, the administrative standards, the um, checklist, all of it. So, um, and like I said, Neil, that was on the one I, I sent, uh, the second set. I apologize, Kay. I'll make sure it's <laughs> on the one that um, I upload. Well, now? Okay. And uh, it's not hard to cater. You can always just search once you get on their site, trees, and you go right to their, yeah. um, their all their information and it's very clear to find. Yep. And um, before we move on to uh, David, uh, David, you're muted, so you're going to need to unmute yourself. And pa panelists, to save time, if you could just look at the Q&A and answer any questions directed towards you, um, uh, that would be great. And also participants, you can see their answers in the Q&A. Thanks. All right, David, um, you should be able to share your screen. It's David Shostak, at least. Mm -hmm. I don't see the shit. Oh, here we go. Got it. There you go. All right. All right. So um, thank you, um, Neil. Thank you, Robert. And thank you. Okay, and uh, I'll thank David after he's done, I guess. Um, so what I'm gonna go over is um, more just the tree prescription requirements. Um, we do have a lot of other requirements um, in Alpharetta when it comes to what you submit in your set of plans related to tree surveys and assessments and things like that. Uh, but I just wanna kind of concentrate on what we're talking about for Alpharetta in regards to tree prescription requirements. So um, in Alpharetta, we do this because we like trees, we value them, we want them to survive. Um, they have many benefits. Um, and in order to do that, we've decided that we wanted to put some of this stuff in our codes. So I'm gonna kind of go through quickly the code sections that are related to um, tree care. Um, so, um, and I put them in order that they show up in the code to make it easier if anybody wants to um, go to the code and look at that. So, um, boundary trees. So, we require tree care for a boundary tree. Um, so, if you are encroaching on a boundary tree, um, even up to 10%, we require tree care. Now, that tree care may simply be root pruning and fertilization and mulch, but we do require that to be part of the tree care plan. Um, and if you read through this, we have different levels of notification that needs to be part of the plan set. So up to 10%, you can encroach without notifying the owner. 10% to 20%, you can um, encroach, but you have to notify the owner and provide them a letter that includes all of these items, current condition, what's gonna to happen to the tree. But you just have to provide me with 
notification. So you have to prove to me that you tried to notify the owner of the tree and get in touch with them. Anything above 20% um, requires an agreement to be in place with the owner of the tree and I need to see that agreement. That's not written in this code section, but it is part of the 20% administrative variance that I'm allowed to give. So that's where that 20% comes from. Okay, so going back to the code requirements, what we require is um, a detailed plan that protects and preserves landscaping and trees before, during, and for a period of two years after construction. So that is all trees. It doesn't just pertain to our specimen trees. Um, what needs to be in that plan are all of the items in the code, all of the items on the arborist checklist, and all of the items found in the arborist guidance document. So we have the checklist, which helps you to understand what needs to be put on your plans. And we have the guidance document, which provides guidelines for tree care and other things in our code. Um, it's similar to uh, Robert's technical standards. So the tree care plan needs to be developed by a qualified professional and that qualified professional will go over some definitions in a minute, but this is designed specifically for each tree that warrants care due to changes in site conditions. So it could simply be a tree that is now opened up, a tree that the hydrology has changed and without any root damage or anything like that. So if you're grading outside the critical root zone of a tree and a tree used to be at the bottom of a slope and used to get water and is now after you're grading at the top of a slope and is not getting any water, even though you haven't gone into that critical root zone, you still have to provide me a care plan for that tree because you have changed the conditions that that tree is growing underneath. So, um, as we're going down through these slides, you'll see that there are links to the different things that I'm talking about. Um, in addition, just like the other cities we've talked about, we do require a paid invoice. I will not open up your construction site without having proof that the tree care has been paid for. So that is also requirement of the city of Alpharetta. Okay, some definitions, a boundary tree. So our definition of a boundary tree is a tree located on adjacent property with a critical root zone that will be impacted by proposed land disturbance activities. So that's pretty simple. Uh, the guidance document, this is the document I was talking about, which is, has the recommendations for tree care. It has how to do our calculations. It has our tree list in it. So it's a good piece of information and it does get changed every now and then. So I do not recommend downloading it. I recommend going to the website every time you need to see it because it does change. Um, in Alpharetta, a qualified professional is either an ISA certified arborist, an American Society of Consulting Arborist, registered consulting arborist, or a Georgia registered forester. Um, and then a tree care plan is basically a plan developed to provide an impacted tree the best possible chance of survival. We do prefer that any tree care guidelines follow ANSI A300. So how do we do this? So the city does rely upon the project arborist. Um, and as Robert stated, there may be a plan development arborist and a project arborist. Those could be two different arborists but we do re rely upon the, the arborists that are working to provide this plan. Um, the way you do it is you perform a site visit. You give me the existing conditions of the trees, you give me species tolerances, and you understand how the impacts are going to affect those individual trees. Um, you look at a comprehensive review of the construction documents. You work with your development team, you work with the engineers, the landscape architects, the grading contractors. So you need to understand the 
percent impacts to the rooting zone, the impacts to the canopy, the impacts to the hydrology based on changes to topography. Um, what trees are going to be removed? What trees are going to stay? Are you opening up a tree to wind throw? Um, the new site layout and building architecture. Are you going to build a building around a tree and put a balcony right where the tree is so your balcony is in the canopy? Are you going to plant a new tree right underneath where a balcony is going to go? So in your tree care plans, you have to understand the building architecture as well as the site layout. Um, we also do require tree care for the newly planted trees. So the project arborist needs to do a review of the landscape plan. They need to understand what is being planted, where it's being planted, what are the growth habits, um, what are its needs, and what kind of competition there will be. So these are all things that you need to do in order to provide me with a proper tree care plan. This is the tree care and maintenance plan section of my arborist checklist. Now I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. These presentations are gonna be available online. Um, Neil has already said that. So, but just quickly, um, I've given you the items that you need to follow. Now I know half of the time the project arborist does not see this. They are just asked by the landscape architect or the developer to put a plan together. Ask them for the checklist, ask them for my comments, look at the guidance document and all of the stuff that's needed. Once you have these things, then you'll be able to put a proper plan together. So in the guidance document, similar to the one you'll see in Smyrna, um, we have example tree care items for existing trees and for newly planted trees. These are found on pages 15 through 18, um, currently 15 through 18. Like I said, the guidance document changes whenever something needs to be added to it. So the page numbers may change, but we talk about tree protection and that just like everybody has talked about before me, consists of chain link, wood slat tree protection, orange tree safe fencing with wire back um, or any other methods. Um, tree protection can also be um, hay bales, sandbags over the rooting zones. It could also be mulch and plywood over the roots. Um, we also have specifications for root pruning, canopy pruning, lightning protection, weed control, mulching, fertilization, insect control, demolition monitoring, compaction reduction. Um, that is something that needs to be added to the guidance document. For some reason, it missed the cut. Um, construction monitoring, post-construction monitoring, and we require notification to the city arborist when any items are completed. So um, these are just kind of the basics that need to be in any plan. These are the things that need to be considered. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be included because lightning protection might need not be needed. Weed control might not be needed, but I need to know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and when you're doing it. So for typical plans, um, I just wanted to kind of stress one of the things. Usually what I get are tree care plans for existing trees only. The new trees always get left out. But what they typically include are root pruning along the limits of disturbance. I rarely get the second set of root pruning that's needed during grading. I get canopy pruning. Um, typically it's a deadwood pruning. Nobody considers the canopy pruning that needs to be done, even though I state it, that needs to be done during um, prior to construction so we don't damage limbs with construction equipment. Fertilization, insect control, construction monitoring, post-construction monitoring, and required notifications. That's typically what I see. The things that are typically missing are new tree care, watering schedules, soil moisture monitoring for post-construction. Compaction reduction is almost always left off. Demolition monitoring, almost always left off. Appropriate timelines and dates. When are you going to do these tree care items? That is always left off. I need appropriate timelines and dates. If I don't have that, how do I know when things are going to be done? 
The other thing is the tree care plan as written, if you are not the person who is going to be bidding on it and doing the work, needs to be written in such a way that the arborist performing the work can bid on it. Otherwise, they're going to have to rewrite it, and I'm going to have to do a whole new review on the tree care plan. Um, that's all I have. So if anybody has any real quick questions that can be asked, otherwise we'll move on to Mr. Zapparanic. Thank you, David. That was great. Um, and and just, just monitor the Q&A if anyone wants to ask a question directly, and then we might cover a few at the very end. But I would like to get on with uh, David, David Zapparanic's presentation. David, you're on. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, it's good to be here to share what our process is for writing prescriptions in the city of Atlanta. Um, the Arborist Division that is that I manage is in the Office of Buildings, um, and we have purview of trees on private property. <clears throat> Um, oh, David, uh, just FYI, we see your notes, but not the presentation. I don't know why that switched. I have no idea. Uh, maybe just go to slideshow mode. Do you have multiple screens? I do. Yo, yes. so make sure you're sharing the correct exactly. screen. Yeah, there you go. Just share the PowerPoint slideshow, not the notes. Yay. Sorry about that, didn't realize. Um, okay, so we're back in business here. <clears throat> um, so what I was uh, saying was um, there are two arborist divisions in the city of Atlanta and the department that I manage is in the Office of Buildings and we have purview of trees on private property the arborist in the Department of Parks and Recreation have purview of trees on public property. Um, so you might, most of the time, the prescriptions are probably gonna be in our office, but um, just wanted to make you aware of that in case you're not familiar with that. Um, so the, 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 uh, the definition here is actually from our tree ordinance. So basically a prescription as we've heard from the others is it's a written um it's a prescription a prescription is written and implemented by a isa certified arborist or registered forester um, implementing measures to protect trees um, using different methods uh, different methods and treatments um, and they are required when a tree's critical root zone or net critical root zone is impacted between 20 and 33%, but the structural root plate is protected 100%. When pre tree prescriptions are required, um, there's actually two circumstances when we require prescriptions. One is when construction is going to happen and that is approved or permitted impact. Um, this impact is, uh, the impact is calculated on the site plans. Um, so that is what the plan reviewer, the Arbor's plan reviewer is looking at and approving. And when it's determined that the impact is, is actually gonna be between 20 and 33, that's when the um, applicant, the permit applicant is, is gonna be uh, told that a prescription is required. And so I'm, I think the way that this usually happens is the, the uh, permit applicant is usually not the arborist, um, but they are the ones who would probably be the one contacting you to, to get involved in this project um, prior to the permit is prior to permit issuance. Um, the sometimes uh, Boundary trees are when boundary trees are involved and then impacted between 20 and 33%. Um, like other municipalities, we require a boundary agreement um, that may or may not be something that you're asked to get involved in. 
Um, but if you are, we have a boundary agreement that is on our web on our web page, the Arborist Division web page. Um, and uh, so that needs to be taken into consideration. There could be other uh, times when a prescription may be required in special circumstances. And it could just be where just something is really different about the about the situation. It could be that the tree, um, the, the critical root zone is restricted um, or it just, uh, it may be a, um, a situation where it's uh, an, a neighbor's tree um, that may not actually be quite impacted um, over 20%, um, but it's better to have, you know, the tree looked at by a professional um, during the construction process. And of course, the benefits of a prescription is that, um, is that there's no recompense or posting and the tree is saved. And the reason I say that if that the tree is saved in the recompense is because if we don't get the prescription, then recompense is paid and we it's required to go through the posting. So it's uh, definitely a, a, it's a much better situation. Um, in the current ordinance, it is when a tree is located in the setback, um, a prescription is required. Um, if it's impacted between 20 and 33%, um, and if the tree is in the buildable area of the lot, it may not be required, but um, because the tree um, is going to be saved, then it, it would be required. And otherwise, it would have to be considered recompense, recompensed um, and posted. Um, in other instances where prescriptions are required, it's when the uh, impact to the critical root zone or net critical root zone is um, done during construction activity, which is not permitted or has not been permitted during the plan review process. So let's just say, you know, the tree fence, you know, was pulled down or um, somebody stored materials in, a, in the tree save area and they shouldn't have, um, then we would uh, require um, a prescription. You know, it could also be that some grading occurred um, that was not previously approved. And if the tree is, and if the treatment program is approved, um, then you know the tree would be saved, and there wouldn't be any fines that would be issued. So uh, requirements for submitting: um, you must be a, a arborist certified by ISA um, or um, registered consulting arborist or a state forested or a state registered forester. Um, <clears throat> so there have been instances where a consulting arborist may write a treatment program, but then they might, uh, he or she might work with another um, arborist or company to implement the, the program. And that needs to be um, fully documented when submitted to us. So, you know, the prescription just make sure that the, the documents that you send us is, is very clear about that um, because the, uh, the, um, the, 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 um, imp, the, the uh, arborist who implements the prescription would be the one that would be um, held, um, held to the prescription to make sure it gets done. Um, and, you know, and the, in the, communication back and forth about the treatment program is the one is the, with the arborist who is doing the, the treatment itself. Um, the report should address uh, impact to the critical root zone, the trunk and or canopy. Um, reviewing uh, should let us know what, what you know about the recent history of the disturbance. Um, whether, and it could be, you know, this could still be during the plan review process, um, you know, perhaps there was uh, the neighbors uh, next door had some construction going on and it impacted the critical root zone of the tree. Um, that may not be something that is picked up on during plan review. So we would need uh, to know that. Um, 
and also know what the impact is to the tree's health and the stability. Including when you're doing the report or, or writing the report, um, the include what the hazard potential is. Um, this may not be something that is readily um, uh, noticeable or we in during our plan review process, um, it would be it would also just need to be in there um, just to know what how the tree is going to be how it's going to do uh, from the impact of the construction or whatever happened um, to the tree and also what your also we want to know what your opinion is about the survivability. Um, that's also very important to know um, so that we can take proper measures. So what we require, what we need to receive from, from you and or the permit applicant is um, the arboricultural prescription and the treatment program. On the Arborist Division webpage, we do have this uh, form available. It's a fillable PDF. Uh, I won't go through all the details, but this is sort of just the general nuts and bolts of just the project itself and um, the arborist name, your contact information, and some basic information about the tree. Um, this is not actually, and of course, this is not just what we need. The report that you write with the treatment of the treatment, um, like the mulching and the watering and the borer treatments, that would be on a on your company letterhead. So uh, this uh, is a, a link that goes to our forms and checklist webpage. Um, if you do not complete the uh, arboricultural prescription form, then you still need to take a look at it um, to know what it is that we require to make sure that uh, we are clear about um, who's, who's, who's gonna be implementing the treatment measures as well as each tree. We wanna have the documentation for each tree. Um, and, and like other municipalities, um, we need to, it's a, we have to have a pre, uh, the prescription does have to be prepaid. Um, and we do also need to approve the prescription. So to make sure that um, that happens, the best way to go about that is to uh, have the prescription submitted to the city arborist. Uh, let them review it and get back with you. Um, once it's approved, then you'll be uh, directed to get payment from the property owner or the builder. Uh, and then that, and once uh, once you have the once it's, once it's been paid, then you would send the proof of payment, um, the arboricultural prescription, and the treatment program to the city arborist. Um, in a plan review process, the, all three of those documents are um, included in the permit set. They're stamped um, so that when we're out in the field, um, that is available um, to, the, to the builder, to the property owner, um, and for whenever site inspections occur. Of course, we're not doing site inspections right now due to COVID, but um, we will be um, doing that. So following up on prescriptions, um, those should, once um, you've, uh, you know, the, there's, the treatment program is going to be, um, it could be just, you know, a couple of treatment treatments, or it could go on for two years, but after each treatment, the, uh, a document should be sent to the city arborist to um, show that you've been out there to do that one particular uh, treatment. You know whether it was just a borer treatment. Um, you know in the first month of, or for the first time, or the second time, or the third time. 
and should just be documented and, and sent to the city arborist. Um, several uh, things that, that get are submitted um, is uh, like other municipalities, the deep root fertilization, mycorrhizal inoculations, bore treatments, mulching, root pruning, tree root growth regulators, um, pruning and air spading. So the process for um, submitting a prescription for, to the city is um, first do an assessment of the tree's health on site um, and evaluate the site conditions and know whether this is, you're writing the prescription um, before impact is going to happen, like uh, during the permitting process, or maybe it happened after or, or during construction. Uh, we would want to know either way. Um, write a treatment program, including your opinion on survivability, um, assuming that the prescriptive measures are going to be done. Um, complete the arborist prescription form, uh, submit it to the city of arborist. Um, and this is for the city arborist to review it, uh, determine if it can be approved or not. Once it's been approved, then I get it paid in full. We do want to make sure that um, you are paid for this. Um, and, and we hold off on giving final arborist approval to, um, to uh, plans that we are reviewing until we have received that. Um, and once, once it's been approved, uh, get all the documentation, uh, send it to the city arborist or send it to the uh, contact person that you have uh, that's through the city and, um, and then submit reports to the city uh, arborist upon completion of each treatment. And that is all I have. Thank you so much, David. Excellent job, everybody. Um, we've gone over our hour. I would like to keep it open for a minute. Everybody who participated today will receive a CEU. I will also be sending out an evaluation and it's also an opportunity for you to submit ideas for future programs. Um, so please review that. I'll be sending that in a couple minutes as well as the links to these um, presentations and the video. So I feel like this was a really great conversation lots of good information. I will ask one question that was um, asked here towards the end to the whole panel and it was addressed in the Q&A. And it's the whole idea is like, I think it's awesome that arborists get paid and you got, and that's part of the requirement. But it's also, um, I've also noticed that a lot of our clients, um, they just write the check and they just see it as like a penalty for doing business. And it's up to us and our own passion and, and ability to, uh, to go out and fulfill those prescriptions. And some of these prescriptions last years. Um, so Tiersen states, um, I'm especially interested if any of your municipal folks think that it would be a good idea. And I'm not saying this would be a good idea. I'm just stating the question to collect data on the success and failure of different private arborists with the idea of eventually using shame and reputation as tools for leveraging greater compliance out of the private sector. I think he means the arbor culture or the arborist community. Um, if I'm wrong about that, Tiersen, fix me. So that, that's a tough question, because but I think it's important we hold ourselves against the fire a little bit and 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 see, you know. It's kind of a loose end, <laughs> I feel like, on these prescriptions. And I don't think we're going to resolve it tonight, but I think it needs to be stated. Um, and I know a lot of people do excellent jobs and follow through. So I don't know if any of the panelists have input about that particular question. And by the way, after this question is answered, I'm going to open it up to the whole, everybody can speak. Um, so unless you mute yourself. And uh, you're welcome to sign off at any time. You don't have to participate in that. All when, right. I get, when I get plans like that, I usually call David Shostak and vent, or he's my therapist. <laughs>
yes, uh, I've I've been Robert's <laughs> therapist many times. Uh, but you know, to to kind of go on what Tiersen said, it's it's the success rate. If you're a project arborist and your trees are consistently dying or declining because you're not doing what you're supposed to do, then I'm either going to stop accepting um, plans from you and I'm going to tell the developer, sorry, I, I can't accept a plan from that person because their trees aren't surviving and they have a track record of that. Um, but I have had to call the developer who's paid for the plan. And I hate to put it in these terms, but tell on an arborist who hasn't been doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, hey, you paid for this. The person you paid isn't doing what they're doing. You know, call them up, tell them to get out here because I'm not getting what I need, which means you're not going to get your CO in the end. So I have had to do that. I, I do the same thing if the um, project manager is asking me questions, you know, about trees and, you know, wondering, I try to bring the project arborist involved in that project through email or divert them to the project arborist to answer those questions. And that's really about it. Yeah, uh, me personally, I haven't had um, I haven't had a situation, you know, like I said, the four square miles and then before that Brookhaven, where I, I didn't have a, a project arborist that wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. Um, but I mean, if I would think if I ever ran into that, I think David has a, a good, good idea there with you know, bringing them in and talking to them. Um, and ultimately, you know, you can always, I hate to say this, but you can always report people to ISA who aren't following our standards that we, we have set for being an ISA arborist. And I would think if you're saying you're treating trees and you're not treating trees, that's gonna get found out eventually and you're gonna end up losing your certification. I don't know if they wanna risk that, but um, as far as tracking the information, I, it, it intrigues me. Um, if anybody else is having you know that situation where you could actually track that information, that would be interesting. We've had some instances where, and we couldn't necessarily prove it, where you know somebody wasn't doing the prescription, but um, it's it's something that's sort of like that's out there that you know we it's always uh, wondering about that, and it's hard to come up with um, a strategy necessarily that. Uh, that can make sure that uh, it, 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 the treatment program occurs. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to have more conversation about that. Yeah, and I think one of the things that Robert and I both do in our cities, Robert requires more than I do, but I require an email to be sent to me that says, we went out today and did this, you know? And I get them, I do. Um, not always, but I do. But I know Robert requires photographs and things like that. So if those people doing the prescriptions aren't providing that to us, then we know it's not getting done. You know, I just went to a site today and they wanted their final CO and I told them I couldn't give them their CO because their arborist hasn't sent me one email. So the, the guy, he told me, I've seen him out here. He's done it. I said, well, then if you've seen them and you paid them, you tell them to send me an email so you can get your CL. So, you know, some of it boils down to that. Great. I think it's, it, it, you know, uh, Tiersen brings up the point, the city of Atlanta being much bigger, it's, it's, it's sometimes even more difficult, but also more resources. So um, it's almost like we need a... Uh, like we've systemized, systematized the checklist. Maybe we need to systemize, systematize the, um, uh, like an, almost like an accounting thing where you, you have to reconcile at the end of the project, like at least send a couple pictures or something like that. I don't know, I'm just putting it out there. Um, but it's something for consideration and something to think about for your future systems 
of uh, having the arborist be able to check in after they've done it. I think that would be uh, good for everybody. Um, and uh, of course it would be one more system for the cities to handle, which I know you guys are pressed on resources and capacity. <laughs> Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, 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 we are. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you all, uh, the panelists. I, I've been asked not to uh, just turn it off. And I think I've said it so you guys can talk. If you can't, I apologize. I'll figure that out next time. But um, please feel free to sign out anytime. You will need to unmute your um, own button if you want to hang out and talk a little bit. And uh, I'll let it just roll for five minutes instead of that hard like Zoom cut off. Like, see ya, bye. I'm gonna go eat dinner. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. We'll see how this works. Good night, everybody. And hey, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Neil. Nice, job, Neil. nice job, guys. That was a great presentation. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, Excellent job. You. Can you guys see me? No. 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 no thankfully, we can't, Pearson. Yeah, you guys are you guys are a lucky bunch tonight. Because I look like shit. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, this is uh, Jesse Milton. This is a uh, an interesting opportunity to have the big four in front of me all at once. Uh, I, have a, I do have a question for y'all, and it's something that I've been thinking about uh, over the years, and I've never had a, a, a good way to, to make it work, but how do you, as municipal arborists, reconcile transferring these multi-year plans across to single-family residential properties? In other words, you know, it's different from a commercial project or a large multifamily project where the developer is probably the owner but in the case of a single builder putting it on the market and then a new owner coming in and then having a year or two of, of treatments we show up and they say who the heck are you and where did you come from and what are you doing to my tree so yep. yeah uh, have you all thought about that at all what, what, how do you reconcile that or how would you like to see it reconciled well, what I've been requiring in Decatur is that they have to get a right of access from that new property owner for you to be able to come back and access the property to treat the tree, because you're right. Once they sell, they no longer own it. So it has to have that right of access come back in with it for you to be able to go back on that private property. And realistically, I probably need to go ahead and just create a draft form that says new owner's name, contact information, arborist name, contact information, so that that's readily available for both parties. And then the statement that they give right of access for the, for the arborist to do it. Right now it's just handwritten on letterhead, um, giving right of access. Yeah, part, part of my um, requirements is that the tree care plan at least have a statement that says the owner is, to, that the ownership is supposed to provide access to the tree for the duration of the prescription. So it's similar to what Kay is saying, but we don't have an official process for that. Um, but you're right, that, that can be an issue. Um, I've done tree care plans in the past where I've knocked on somebody's door and they're like, who are you? And you know, I've had to explain why I'm there and what I'm doing. Um, but you know, most of the time it's just for inspections. Some of it is actual treatments, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, same in Smyrna. We don't officially have anything to try to have the, the developer talk to the owner and get something in writing. And if it's a big HOA, um, having the developer talk to the HOA, get them on board, and then as they're selling units, that form is going out to them. Yeah, what, one, more, one more thing. Um, 
a lot of times what happens in Alpharetta now is some of these subdivisions are being built so slowly that the house that has the actual trees on it um, is sold and the arborist is still working on the full development and they're taking care of those trees. So the new owner knows the arborist because they're there during construction of the other um, homes. Um, and that works, you know, just because that one tree that may be on that one lot or the couple of trees that may be on a couple of five lots, um, you know, are still being cared for while the neighborhood's being built and the new owners know what's going on. But other than that, we do need a better system. Thanks, I appreciate your answers. Lyle has an interesting question. He goes, I have clients that are very anti-chemical. What would happen if someone bought a house and wasn't told about an existing prescription that required chemical applications to the tree on their property? Can you say that again? Can you uh, say it again? I have, I have clients that are very anti-chemical. What would happen if someone bought a house wasn't told about an existing prescription that required chemical applica applications to the tree on their property. I guess you just communicate. I mean, it, it's their option. Yeah, you can't chemical trespass, so. I think that there would have to be another assessment done at that time because, you know, at that point, there's probably been several treatments that's happened thus, thus far. And um, it could be that, you know, perhaps maybe just one more treatment and it would have been done or something. Um, or, and, and it might actually end up being okay. We could just say, okay, well, you know, maybe the, that isn't required at this time. Um, maybe it was just being, you know, an extra, being extra careful. But you know, if it's if it's still lacking quite a few treatments, um, then then uh, I, I would think that we might actually end up just having to charge recompense for the tree if, if we know that the treatment program isn't going to be uh, completed. Yeah, I, I would agree with David in the sense that. Um, if the treatment plan is not going to be completed, you would either need a new treatment plan that maybe didn't use chemicals, that a new treatment plan, a new assessment and treatment plan that didn't use chemicals. Um, as long as the two arborists felt it was good, then that's one thing. But if not, you know, and the tree is going to decline because it was impacted and not cared for, then there would be some sort of recompense for it. Hey guys, this is uh, Lindsay at Sandy Springs. And um, this is definitely something that I'm trying to push onto my municipality because we don't have any options for prescriptions right now. Um, I like what David was saying where he asked the arborist just to send him a notification when they go out. But do you guys require any sort of assessment reports during the construction? And is that done quarterly or how often? And what do you do if it lapses and you don't receive any reports? In, in Smyrna, it really depends on the impacts of the tree. So there could be monthly monitoring reports that, that come out um, if it's, um, during the inventory stage of it. Yeah, there, there's tree risk assessment reports for specimen trees that need to be put on the plan and then for boundary trees. Um, but monthly inspections typically are, month, are, are run every month um, on smaller projects. Probably can that time frame can increase or decrease it really depends on the trees and the impacts yeah in 
In Alpharetta, I prefer that we have monthly inspections during construction. And these are for the larger construction sites, individual homes um, in an existing subdivision or a pool project. Those are a little different, but I prefer monthly. And the monthly inspections are supposed to include um, a detailed description of any changes to the tree. So if you get out there and the tree still looks the same and it still looks fine, that's what I want to know. So nothing would change in your prescription. But if you get out there and you start to see the tree declining and you realize, well, it's declining because we haven't had any rain and no one's put a soaker hose around this tree. Well, then I need to know that and I need to know what you're going to do about it and how you're going to change the prescription to keep the tree from declining. Same thing if you get out there and you notice that it's being attacked by wood boring insects. What are you going to do to fix that? you know, if you can. Um, so the monthly inspections are supposed to detail changes to the tree's health. I'm just looking at the arborists that are here on this call right now, and it's amazing. It's a really, I think you'll recognize most of the names. Ed, I bet that's Ed Macy. Is that Ed Macy? <laughs> well, I don't want to keep you guys from eating, so, you know, this has been a really great talk, though. And uh, I think, uh, once again, I think we'll close it. I, I, I'm going to leave it open till eight o'clock. Uh, so I guess you guys have, you know, talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. Well, hey guys, it's Lucas here. Um, I just want to say I've been stuck on my own for the last couple of months. So it's nice to see people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. And uh, I'm going to go and eat. So I'll catch you all later. Thank you. So much. I, I'm going to say that I'm going to, I'm gonna probably speak for all of us and say that if you guys have any other questions after the fact, feel free to send us emails, especially if it's specific to our own municipalities. Definitely. I'm not speaking out of line. <laughs> nope, we get emails all the time. Send us your questions. <laughs> Seeing it's going to be raining tomorrow, I'll be available. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> going to be doing plan reviews tomorrow. Plan reviews. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that don't know, our tree climbing competition is this weekend. I forgot, failed to mention that. Um, it's we've got like I think fifty competitors or forty-eight competitors. It's and. We're going to have a Friday night aerial ascent head-to-head uh, -head, um, that's going to be really fun. And the weather should, I think it's going to, I think it's looking good. It's kind of, Edda sort of slowed down in Florida, I'm hoping. So we should get some okay weather. Fine on Friday for sure. That's good. All right, we'll see y'all. Yeah. Right. Yep. Good night, everybody. I'm going to just good night. sit down and uh, have a good night.